My name is Andrew Mora. I've been with Dimplex Thermal Solutions for a little over nine years. I've done a lot of things like project engineering, primarily compliance. And today we're going to go ahead and cover the um, refrigeration regulations that are going on in the United States and all over the, uh, Europe. Uh, right here, I have a uh, refrigerant landscape. A couple things to point out on here is we have a flammability line. Anything above that flammability line is an A1. A1 refrigerants are non-flammable. Anything below this line ends up being a, a flammable refrigerant. So we have an A2L, an A3. A2Ls are mildly flammable. A3s are highly flammable. So when we start thinking of highly flammable, we think about propane. Key points to take away from here, we have the different GWP limits. So when we start talking about lower GWP, as you can tell, the lower we go, the more flammable things become. So when we talk about propane, he's a GWP of three. And we talk about a refrigerant called 513A, he's 573. But when we start talking about more of our common refrigerants, like the 407C or like 404A, those guys are significantly higher. Right now, um, from what we're seeing in the industry, at least for industrial process chillers, um, our 513A at least is our choice for moving forward at Dimplex Thermal Solutions. It going anywhere is flammable or highly flammable will go ahead and take you know, significant evaluation um, before you switch over to those. So I have uh, before you just the US only, we're not talking about PFOS, um, compliance overview in regards to industrial process chillers. Industrial process chillers are very important, that definition, because each of the different regulations out there, whether it's per state level, whether it's on the federal level, what really matters is, is how they define a chiller. So in my case, it's industrial process chillers. Typically, if you look at the definitions, some of these go ahead and define uh, a chiller as comfort cooling. So we don't do any of that at Dimplex Thermal Solutions. It's all industrial process. So to start it off, we have the uh, EPA's AIM Act. Um, it's at least uh, pending. It goes into effect uh, January 1st, 2025. Uh, we're waiting for the final um, version of that. We uh, right now we are affected with you know not having refrigerants that are over 700 GWP, and then um, but you know if anything is lower than negative 58 degrees Fahrenheit for the leaving fluid temperature of that process fluid, it's not regulated. So like I said, this is pending. It's not finally released yet. Hopefully. Uh, in September here in 2023, we'll see something that's the final. It might be in October. Um, hopefully, we'll see something that's more kind of like California's that I have over here that I'll explain, where it actually breaks it down per leaving fluid temperature. But right now, it's um, proposed to just be um, all of them that are industrial process cooling. 700 GWP or less is the refrigerant that you can use. Next up, we have the SNAP Act under the EPA. SNAP Act is covering what refrigerants are approved for um, those end uses. So in our case, it's industrial process refrigeration. Right now, we have it proposed that A2Ls are acceptable. It's not finalized yet. So technically, if you introduced an A2L into the workspace, manufacturing environment, um, that's essentially violating OSHA's um, allowed refrigerants for that end use. We are expecting, though, that the finalization would be sometime Q1 of next year, so January, February of 2024. Briefly cover um, the state level. Right now, the biggest one for regulating refrigerants ends up being California's car regulation. So that goes into effect first of this year, so January 1st of 2024. Um, the uh, uh, this limits the leaving fluid temperature, like I already mentioned, and they do break things down based on how cold are you going. So the chiller would have to be regulated at those set points, but the colder you go, at least the higher GWP you could use um, for refrigerants. Uh, another topic I'll cover is product safety standards. Uh, there's been some changes where the legacy for industrial process chillers has been UL 1995. Uh, that will no longer be supported as of next year, September. 
the transition is to go to a new standard 60335, um, specifically 60335-2-89. Um, this standard specifically adds in um, criteria that will allow you to use A2L refrigerants. There's nothing about A3s, so you can't use propane. There is a minimum amount that you could use, um, but as far as, you know, I would say economical amounts, so you could have larger chillers indoors, um, you know, only A2Ls are covered. And there's definitely nothing on ammonia. That's all hazardous location. Um, but um, if you want to use an A2L, it has the product safety standard, but um, you basically have to go ahead and reevaluate. So anything that's already UL 1995 um, evaluated, it'll still maintain its listing as a transition and you can still build it. Um, you just, you know, if you want to go to an A2L, you're going to have to invest some money and get relisted. Lastly, just a quick mention on the ASHRAE standard, specifically ASHRAE 15. Right now, um, ASHRAE is working on uh, just determining when uh, an A3, primarily propane, could be used in a refrigeration circuit. How much can be added? You know, what makes it safe to have um, in an actual end use without having to do hazardous location? So it'll definitely take some time, but um, that is being worked on right now. Uh, just a quick note about the penalties under CARB. Um, right now, uh, CARB, once that goes into effect, um, there is a fine. Um, it's not more than $5,000, um, or they also talk about being in the county jail um, for not more than six months or both. Each of these violations uh, is a separate offense each day of the occurrence. I won't go into extreme detail on the overall compliance timeline, but I would definitely like to cover the breakdown as time goes on as far as the united states what we're seeing and just kind of you know taking everything i've mentioned and kind of condensing it to a nice graph um right now you know you're talking about that you can definitely use refrigerants over 750 gwp for industrial process chillers once we transition in 2024 you basically can sell it to everywhere in the united states but california that's the primary limit um, then uh, we go ahead and when we transition into 2025, that's when the AIM Act would take effect. Assuming it doesn't change drastically and it maintains pretty much what it has right now, we basically have to stick with things that are less than 750 GWP, uh, but that would be for all the states. And as time goes on, you can switch over to, you know, things open up for A2Ls, and then in the distant future, you could switch over to an A3. The EPA SNAP uh, Act uh, does not allow us to use A2Ls for the end use in like manufacturing environments. That's the finalization is not expected until you know Q1 of 2024. Um, next up is you know discussing uh, you know with authority having jurisdiction you know how we could safely store these A2L refrigerants and how should we properly handle them in our shop. Um, I know that also applies to customers who may you know store refrigerant and have their own maintenance team that takes care of uh, these chillers um, that is something that has to be determined by whoever it is fire marshal or some other inspector to find out are you storing it outdoors or indoors or have to have ventilation um, that's definitely something that has to be considered um, when we start talking about you know 60335 the 2-80 that new ul standard we definitely would go ahead and have to consider um, it, chiller will have to be different. It's going to have to be designed differently. And so we will have to have a fan run continuously. We'll have to have a leak detector and even ventilation to the outdoors, depending on what that charge size is. And so just getting a chiller into your facility, you know, it's, it's not as simple as it was before where you really didn't have to consider um, too much. But now, you know, depending on how big that chiller can be and how safe it can be, you know, you're going to have to consider the actual layout of the factory floor. Uh, one thing that we're seeing is um, we definitely will have to make sure that our service technicians, outside contractors, and even our testers inside of our manufacturing facility, that they've all been certified to um, handle A2Ls. Um, right now that that is a requirement in the UL listing that we go ahead and have, you know, some sort of uh, training program or certification process um, for doing that. Two last items. One is the Department of Transportation. 
there are limits on <clears throat> the amount of flammable refrigerant that you can ship. So right now it's 25 pounds. So if you have a chiller that has over 25 pounds of flammable refrigerant, whether it's an A2L or um, an A3, uh, we, you will have to have it as a hazmat shipment. And right now, anything over four ounces cannot ship via air. Lastly, there's the local building codes. So we have a map. This is as of April of 2023. Um, just showing you the landscape of all the different states that currently right now allow A2Ls in their building code. So there's definitely quite a few that don't have A2Ls even, you know, at least applied for whether it's air conditioning or refrigeration, which for industrial process chillers, refrigeration is what we're talking about. So there's there's definitely a few that are, but there's definitely a lot of states that are outstanding. The understanding here is that, you know, whoever the authority is having jurisdiction, that, you know, they're essentially the the gatekeeper there. You know, if you have the product safety standard, this, you know, 60335 applied to your product, um, like my chillers, you know, is that enough for them? Or does building code take precedent and say, hey, I, you know, I don't care that it has this, you know, listing on there. Um, it doesn't meet my uh, state's building code. You can't use it. And that is definitely, um, I would say, a risk. Uh, right now if you were to use an a2l a couple things that are on the horizon uh, that we're seeing is that california is uh, proceeding to go into ultra low gwp so they're looking at transitioning you know below 30 gwp um, and they're definitely supposed to come up with a transition you know how do they complete that by 2035 and we're expecting something January 1st of 2025 on that. Uh, something else that's also been uh, finalized is uh, limiting the imports of bulk version refrigerants. So I have a nice little chart here, at least that's listing them out um, and when those take effect. And I've listed at least the major refrigerants that are used there. So like in 2025, you basically will have to use reclaimed um, or, you know, it, it filtered refrigerants uh, for 404A starting 2025, 2030 is going to be 407C, 410A, and then when you get to 2033 right now, it'll be 134A and 448A. Um, so expect those prices to go up, you know, as, uh, especially in California as time goes on. I've also seen that uh, New York State is looking at doing a similar thing as far as looking at transitioning to lower than 30 GWP. Something I haven't talked about yet is um, where does Europe stand in all of this? So right now there are um, three proposals and the trilogs are currently ongoing. Hopefully we'll see something finalized here in September, October, the next month or two. Um, right now we have uh, three different proposals. Uh, pretty much you can tell, though, the limitations here, or at least where everyone's centering around, is 150 GWP and January 1st of 2025. So that's definitely significantly more aggressive than what we have here in the United States. Next up is PFOS. So we've definitely have heard about it on the news. It's definitely nasty, um, but it also affects refrigerants. So something that... Uh, you know that that is known is that uh, when we get some of these synthetic refrigerants they go ahead and go up into the atmosphere they break down and they come back down and turn into essentially tfa this tfa is nasty um it is uh particularly uh, not kind to aquatic life um and of course if it's coming down when it rains from the atmosphere it's getting into our rainwater, groundwater and into the ocean um, and it will accumulate over time uh, so this is something that has been proposed to reach, and right now they're at least mulling over um, how to implement it. And just like with the other regulations in Europe, we're still waiting to hear about what is the finalization of this. Is it going to be a transition? Is there exemptions? That stuff is not known at this time, but definitely expecting some sort of implementation of it in 2025 and or 2026 if things don't drastically change. Also going on with PFOS is a few things here in the United States. 
So the EPA right now is looking at just overall, what is, you know, what are the nasty ones? It's, I think, about 12,000 different chemicals that are considered PFOSs. Uh, only about maybe two or 300 are actually used in industry. So the EPA is looking at it from um, toxicology based, you know, instead of doing an outright ban um, because, you know, Europe like doesn't want all PFOS, um, the EPA is looking at, hey, are there any that are acceptable? My understanding is, is that there are PFOSs that are not toxic to humans, animals. And so, you know, they're not going to try and ban that, but uh, they definitely have to understand what each of them is. So right now the EPA is working on that. Um, and we'll probably hear more next year on what's going on as far as what they're going to propose. Uh, on the state level, right now, Maine has taken the lead. They've gone ahead and proposed a ban as of January 1st, 2030. Um, that is left open. If you actually go onto their website, you can actually see that they um, acknowledge that refrigerants, yep, they turned to TFA and that they are included in this ban, but that they may change their opinion or, you know, alter it slightly once they get closer to that date. Um, otherwise, we are in the reporting phase as of January 1st of this year for, um, you know, if you're importing PFOSs. There is a catch, though, uh, where if the... Um, if the knowledge of the PFOS is publicly known, then you know it doesn't have to be reported individually. So refrigerants are definitely becoming more well known um, as creating TFA. So it's more likely a public knowledge now. Uh, just want to say thank you for your time. If you have any questions or would like a copy of this PowerPoint, uh, please email my colleague Denise um, here below.